Worried about your drinking? Reserve your place on today's free quit drinking webinar and get a copy of my best-selling book, Alcohol Lied to Me, as a gift just for turning up. www.stopdrinkingexpert.com Hello, hello. How are you? This is Craig Beck, a.k.a. the Stop Drinking Expert. And welcome into another episode of the Happy Sober Podcast. Uh, today, we're going to talk about those pesky people who appear to be able to socially drink alcohol and never have a problem with it at any, any point in their life. How dare they? Let's talk about that. Eh? If you've just arrived and you discovered the podcast and you're worried about your drinking, the next step, let me tell you, it's really simple. You go to the website, stopdrinkingexpert.com, and you get a copy of my best-selling book, Alcohol Lied to Me, and it will fix your problem. And you're thinking, Craig, how dare you be shilling me to buy products when I've only just got here? I'm not. It's absolutely free of charge. Go and download it from the website at the end of the podcast, stopdrinkingexpert.com. All right. So today, let's talk about how it's so unfair that you've managed to get into trouble with alcohol when your best friend has no problem with it at all. In fact, God damn it, she can open a bottle of wine, have one glass and put the rest of the bottle in the fridge and not come back to it for another day. How does she do that? Is it black magic? What on earth is going on? And the reason we're talking about that is because I had an email from Edward and he, he wants to know, really. He says, hi, Craig, I've got a quick question. Before you mentioned that we're not like those annoying people who can have a glass of wine and say, pop the bottle back in the fridge uh, like many people can. However, do these people who can have one drink not run the risk of getting addicted? Or does it become addictive when, in some cases, alcohol is coupled with some past trauma and used as a coping mechanism? The reason I ask is because my ex-partner, split up in February last year because of my weekend binge drinking, has started to regularly drink a single glass of Bailey's on an evening. Uh, I'm not just concerned she's... Sp um, I am just concerned she's spinning the barrel in the game of Russian roulette and considering she's using that Bailey's as a coping mechanism for her current situation without her noticing. Uh, I'm back on the wagon now uh, after choosing uh, weekend binge drinking over my family back in February last year. My ego got in the way. Why shouldn't I be able to drink and do adult stuff on the weekends? What an idiot I was. Anyway, I hope you read this, and thank you again for helping. Kind regards, your biggest fan, Edward. All right, good question, Edward, and it's a complicated answer. Uh, and it is just a theory because really we don't really know what goes on inside the human mind. Um, but look, I can, I can tell you what the stats are. Um, women generally don't, this, and this is a real generalization, but I'm just going to tell you what I've experienced over the last kind of 15 years of doing this. Women don't generally develop a drinking problem until they're into their 40s. Whereas men tend to, tend to establish it much earlier. So it's not unusual for a woman who's had absolutely no problem with alcohol to get to middle age and suddenly start to develop a problem. That's quite common. Men, it, the seed is always there. You know, it's kind of like from the 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 fun drinking of the, you know, your early 20s. The seed is already there, and men develop an issue much sooner than women for some reason. I don't really know why. Um, it might be something to do with the emptiness syndrome. You know, women have this uh, more laser-guided focus of their purpose. You know, they're, they're being a mother. They're bringing children into the world, and they get into their middle age. They get into their 40s and the 50s, and the kids don't need them anymore, and suddenly there's this massive vacuum in their life, and alcohol pops up and goes, hey, I can help you with this. So that might be it, but I'm just, you know, I'm thinking out loud, I'm speculating. So that's the first thing. There are, there are some patterns here. So I don't know how old your partner is, um, but if she's middle-aged and she's started drinking regularly, then she's she is running a risk. Why do some people have a problem with alcohol? And how do you know if you're going to have a problem with alcohol? And it, it's... It's almost an impossible question to answer because, you know, you know, I make the analogy in the book that drinking alcohol is like playing Russian roulette. And it is entirely possible that you can play Russian roulette. You, you know, you, Russian roulette is the, that fabled 
um, very dark game where you put one bullet in a six slot revolver, spin the barrel, put it to your head and pull the trigger. Uh, and I don't know if anyone ever played this game because I don't know why you would, but there's all these rumors and you know folklore of you know, soldiers on the front line playing it out of desperation and boredom and all this sort of stuff. But it is entirely possible that you could play Russian roulette every day of your life and get away with it. And the, you never, ever die. You never, ever get shot in the head from the gun. That's entirely possible. Uh, and, and the same is true of alcohol. There are people there who just get away with it. It just never takes hold. But you don't know if you're going to want to be one of those lucky people until you get to the end of the journey. So the only way to ensure that you're not one of the unlucky people that gets shot in the head is not to play the game. And but that's you know that's that's the simple answer isn't it? You know, if you want to be absolutely sure that you won't get a drinking problem, never drink alcohol. And that's far too simpler an answer. I, I know that. But you know, the thing is with alcohol it, it's it's like quicksand. So you approach this piece of land and you don't know if there's no signs, it looks like it's firm land, but you don't know until you get out into the middle. And just like quicksand, and maybe just like your partner, it starts so painfully slowly. You know, one glass of Bailey's a night. What a big whoop. You know, big deal. I mean, you can't even speak to her about that, can you? You can't say, oh, you know, be careful. Because her response is, is predictable. It's going to be one glass of Bailey's and you're having a go at me. Yeah, you can see it from her side, can't you? But that's that's like quicksand. You get out there into the middle of the quicksand and you, you're sinking so slowly and you can see safety just over there. You're thinking, I'll deal with this later. Well, you know, what's the big deal? What's the rush? Later I'll deal with this. Now it's not a problem. And we know how the story goes, right? You get up to your waist and you think, all right, better make a move. And you start to struggle. And you realize... I can't get out. So you struggle a bit more. And what happens? You sink quicker. And that's exactly what happens with alcohol. So that's, you know, you're right. She is playing Russian roulette, but no more so than anyone else is. And there's nothing you can really do about this. You know, th this is not a sort of thing where you can have a sit down with her and say, look, you know, we need to talk about this glass of Baileys you're having every night because she's not going to accept it. She's just going to think you're being, you know, get your nose out of my business. Why are you focusing on me so much? You've got your own problems to deal with. Off you go. There's, you know, I think maybe you just need to relax a little bit on this one because you've been through this trauma. You've got, you've got the PTSD from it. And when you see other people walking down the same path, you want to grab them and shake them and say, stop, don't do it. But unfortunately, and just like, you know, having kids, as much as you would like to sit your kids down and explain everything that could possibly go wrong in life and give them the directions on how to avoid them, they will ignore you. And they will continue to make the same mistakes that you made in the same way, in the same order. And it's frustrating and it's, you know, it's hard to take, especially when you love that person. But unfortunately, that's just how it has to be done. People learn through experience. Uh, so look, Maybe she'll get a problem. Maybe she won't. It's it's kind of an impossible situation. You, you, you can't step in now because she'll think you're interfering in her life. Maybe she'll continue to have one glass of Baileys a night for the rest of her life. And that happens as well. And, and it's never, you know, whether you quantify whether you've got a drinking problem or not is never about the quantity or even the frequency. The definition, how you know for sure, Edward, if you've got a drinking problem, is how it makes you feel. If your use of alcohol in your sober moments makes you miserable, you have a problem with alcohol. That's it. If every day you're waking up and going, oh, I drank again last night. Oh, my God. I said I wouldn't. And I drank again last night. I hate myself. I'm not, right. I'm not drinking tonight. I hate myself. And that's your life. That's your loop. Then you have a drinking problem. It's not about how many drinks you have or how often you drink. Because if it was, then I'd be able to just give you a number and say, if you get to this number, then you're an alcoholic. If you get to this number, you're a problem drinker. 
under this number, you're safe because it doesn't work like that. And, you know, I did a boot camp in San Francisco about seven years ago, something like that. Uh, and an old guy came along. He was in his mid 70s. And I've told this story many times, but it, I think it's a valuable one. Uh, at the start of the boot camp, I go around the room and I say to people, eh, tell me your name, where you've come from, and tell me a bit about your drinking. Why are you here today? And we went around the room and it was the usual story. Hi, Craig. You know, I'm Samantha. I'm from New York and I'm drinking two bottles of wine a night and I hate my life and I hate myself, blah, blah, blah. That story repeated. And we got to this old guy. I think he was called Lewis or something like that. And he stood up and he said, hi, my name's Lewis. Uh, he said, I'm, um, I'm from Kansas or somewhere. He said, uh, I drink uh, one miniature bottle of vodka a night, and I have done for the last 25 years. <laughs> and I said, Lewis, what do you mean by miniature bottle of vodka? Like half a bottle of, like a, he said, no, 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 no. You know, the, the really small ones you get on airplanes that have got like one, two measure, measures of vodka in? He said, I have one of those every night. And I have done for 25 years. He said, that's why I'm here. I said, Lewis, I think you're in the wrong room. <laughs> I think I th you've come a long way, really, for not a very big problem by the sound of it. And he stopped me dead. He said, Craig, listen. He said, I hate it. He said, I hate. I can't not have it. He said, it's impossible for me. No matter what I do, I cannot not have that glass of vodka every night. He said, and it's been making me miserable for the last 10 years. He said, I'm absolutely at the end of my tether with it. I'm in control of every aspect of my life apart from this one thing. And I hate, hate, hate it. Now tell me that alcohol isn't a problem for him. Now tell me that he doesn't have a major problem with alcohol. Of course he does. His life is being made miserable by this substance that's peddled in grocery stores and on every street corner, and he can't escape it, and he hates himself because of it. And he's drinking one miniature of vodka a night. So I think that's important. The question is, how do you feel about it? And the question for your partner is, how does she feel about it? Does she even consider it? Does she th wake up every morning and go, oh, I can't believe I drank a glass of Bailey's again? Or is it j not even on her radar? When it gets onto her radar and she starts to question herself, that's when maybe she should watch this video. So it's a kind of long-winded answer. Uh, and to kind of summarize uh, why some people never have a problem at all, it's, it's just basically, A, the way it affects you. You know, some people, when they drink alcohol, their brain lights up like a Christmas tree. It's like, whoa, oh, the lights have come on. This is amazing. Some people, when they drink alcohol, that doesn't happen. And can you imagine getting no real buzz from it? So you've just got that horrible tasting liquid. You drink it to be sociable and you don't get any buzz. Why would you get addicted? And for a lot of people, that is the case. For a lot of people, they never, ever, ever get over how horrible it tastes. We problem drinkers, we teach ourselves to get over the horrible taste. And then we become wine connoisseurs and we buy fine wine instead of cheap plunk because we notice the subtle differences. Bullshit. We've just taught ourselves to drink gasoline and tell ourselves that it's orange juice. Well, some people, they never, they never achieve that. They can never get over how horrible this stuff tastes so they kind of force it down like medicine at parties they're like oh, 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 i need to just drink a bit more so i'm a bit more sociable and a bit more chatty and i'm not so boring I'll force a bit more down but they never get to the point where they fool themselves that they like the taste of it and that's true for a lot of people as well um so that's the main part the secondary reason why a lot of people don't get into a trouble with alcohol is like you said, they're not using it to cover something up. And that's, you know, 99% of the people that come to me are using alcohol um, to cover up something bigger. And that can be, you know, that can be anything. It can be the weirdest things, you know? Um, it could, it could be something like you said, trauma in the past. It could be being in an abusive relationship. It could be being lost and directionless in your career. It could be 
full of guilt and regret for something bad you did in the past and you just can't get it out of your head. And so you drink the anesthetic to make it go away and you get into that loop. Well, you know, a lot of people have better coping mechanisms than us. They're not maybe as, you know, they didn't turn to an external source to deal with their internal problems. Maybe, you know, I mean, look, don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean they're better than us. You know, maybe they're, they're just using something else to cope. You know, you get these people who exercise to the point of ridiculousness. You know, they're in the gym for four hours a day and they're using that as their coping mechanism. Some people are hoarders. Some people fill their house with junk and it's a coping mechanism. So, you know, just because they didn't go down the alcohol path doesn't mean they're perfect and their poo doesn't smell. It just means that they're perhaps using a different system to deal with the pain in their life and they didn't pick the same system as you. I don't know. It depends. So, look, I hope that helps. Uh, if you have a question about alcohol, about addiction, about anything like that, drop me an email via the website, stopdrinkingexpert.com. And if you are worried about your drinking, don't sit on the fence. That's going to go nowhere. Go to the website and get your free copy of my book. Thanks a lot. See you in the next episode. Worried about your drinking? Reserve your place on today's free quit drinking webinar and get a copy of my best selling book, Alcohol Lied to Me, as a gift just for turning up www.stopdrinkingexpert.com